Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Wow Cornell Breast Center and Five Under 40's fourth Young Women's Breast Cancer Survivorship Symposium. This is our second virtual event to date. Uh, to those of you who don't know me, my name is Jennifer Finkelstein, and I was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 32, a few weeks before my wedding, and I am a proud Wild Cornell patient. Um, my largest role is I serve as president and founder of the Five Under 40 Foundation. To those of you who are new to our organization, we fund medical, beauty, wellness, and educational services to young women diagnosed with breast cancer or, or those with a BRCA mutation. We focus on a woman's whole being in order to empower, foster hope, and improve the quality of life for patients in the face of this disease. Um, we do this in ways big and small from meetups, virtual meetups, very soon in-person meetups, metastatic meetups, galas, um, we have a successful peer match program, shopping events, summer events, donated merchandise, accompany women for wig, wigs, but really at the heart of what we do is education. And that is why this event tonight is my favorite event of the year or every other year since it's been biannual, since its inception in 2016. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank the outstanding medical doctor staff at Wild Cornell Breast Center. Um, Dr. Moore and I will celebrate 17 years next month since we first met. And uh, she took me by the hand and changed my life. Um, I want to say where you are treated makes all of the difference and you will not find another institution right now that will donate their time, their resources, their knowledge fresh out of at the annual ASCO meeting than this institution. All of you are treated at many different institutions and I really think that that is one of the many ways that um, this, this hospital is unique. Um, and Dr. Moore heads up the Survivorship Center, um, which is a phenomenal resource. Um, and Dr. Tessa Sigler, um, who's also one of my doctors, um, serves as the clinical director of the Weill Cornell Breast Center. So. Without further ado, um, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Sigler. Thank you so much, Jen, and hello to everyone. Good evening. I'm so pleased to be here, and I'm so pleased that every one of you are here tonight. So we have a, um, a great agenda, and a, I've been told that we each have to keep on time. So let me tell you, um, let me give you a brief overview of our program tonight. Thank you so much, Jen, for your introduction. I'm going to speak on updates in bre on breast cancer. Um, my colleague, Dr. Guy Natal, who's a psychiatrist, he works at Cornell, and he specializes in oncologic care, um, is going to talk to us about coping mechanisms. Um, Emily Buckholtz, who is a nutritionist who also works at Cornell at our breast center, is going to give us some tips. And Sarah Strimmel, who is a yoga, wellness, fitness guru, is going to do some yoga with us. And we're also going to hear um, from Samantha Frigenti about a patient perspective. So full disclosure, I'm going to give an update in breast cancer, and I'm going to do it really fast and really quickly so we can cover a lot. Um, but in doing that, things are definitely going to be simplified, um, and I might leave some things out. So let's, here we go. So as you all probably know about 10,000 women aged 40 and younger are diagnosed with breast cancer each year. So despite um, sometimes feeling alone in this diagnosis, you should know that you are not, and it is more common than 
um, many people think. Um, young women have a more difficult time with their breast cancer diagnosis for many reasons, including the unique issues they face to do, to do with their work, their career, um, dating, family planning, parenting. And um, here's data from Cornell, and you can see that um, for women diagnosed with breast cancer, less than 40 is a small percentage, about six or 7% of our patients. And when you add in patients under 50, it's actually quite a big chunk um, of our patients. Um, the good news is that the majority of our patients are diagnosed at early stage, stage zero and one, and even stage two. Treatment options are increasing and improving um, and the, the future is bright. What about recent advances? And so these are advances in the past, um, mostly in the past year in 2021, it affects all subtypes and all stages of breast cancer. Um, immunotherapy for early stage triple negative breast cancer is one of the highlights of 2021. Um, as we know, and as is a theme in breast cancer, therapies are often first shown to be effective in treating um, women with advanced um, breast cancer and immunotherapy has made um, great strides in the treatment of advanced triple negative breast cancer. And the keynote 522 was a study published this year, which tested an immunotherapy drug called pembrolizumab in early stage, but high risk triple negative breast cancer. And so this was a large study, more than a thousand patients who all received chemotherapy before surgery. And half of the, and all patients received standard chemotherapy and half of the patients were randomized to to have the addition of the immunotherapy pembrolizumab added, um, both with the chemotherapy before surgery and also for several cycles following um, surgery. Um, and the results um, which had been previously reported were updated to really show that those women who received the pembrolizumab had higher, resp higher response rates in the breast at the time of surgery and did better um, now with years follow up after surgery. And so, so this has become a new standard of care um, for um, women with um, high risk but early stage triple negative breast cancer. What about PARP inhibitors for BRCA associated breast cancer? Well, here's the theme, PARP inhibitors were recently shown to be effective in treating women with advanced BRCA associated breast cancer. And now we have results published this year from the big Olympiad study, which tested olaparib, which is a PARP inhibitor in early stage BRCA associated breast cancer. These results were published in the, the most, um, the most um, prestigious journal, the New England Journal of Medicine. And we were very pleased to know that for women ERP or positive, um, ER positive or triple negative um, BRCA associated breast cancers. Again, um, a certain um, group of these women, not all women, did have a benefit when PARP inhibitor or laparib was added to their treatment program. Um, tailoring therapy for ER positive and node positive early stage breast cancer. There were also some updates. And as many of you know, the Oncotype is a genomic assay that's used to predict the benefit of chemotherapy for women with early stage ER positive breast cancer. We've known for many years that Oncotype is well validated um, to help make the decision about chemotherapy for women with node negative ER positive breast cancer. And the RX Bonder trial, which was published this year, uh, just in 2021, evaluated the Oncotype, DX, um, di the Oncotype DX for women with ER positive breast cancer, but also node positive breast cancer. Um, in the study, um, all women who had um, a recurrence, all women with node positive ER positive breast cancer had an oncotype done. And those who had oncotype scores of less than 25 were randomized to um, either chemotherapy and hormonal therapy or hormonal therapy alone. And the results, um, the results um, were impressive. Um, one of the reasons I like the study is they pulled out um, premenopausal women, young women younger than 50 versus the rest of the group. Um, and we saw that for all comers and postmenopausal women um, who had oncotype scores less than 25 did not benefit from chemotherapy. But for premenopausal women, um, any oncotype, an oncotype score even less than 25 was associated with the benefit of chemotherapy. And so we really, um, it is a new tool um, to be used in 
um, postmenopausal with ER positive and node positive breast cancer. And we learned from the study that for, for younger women, premenopausal women with node positive disease, um, we like to be or on the side of caution and probably give chemotherapy. And obviously there's lots of reasons um, not to always follow the study. Metformin is an ant is a anti um, diabetic medication that had gotten a lot of press many years ago because there was a strong scientific rationale <clears throat> for why metformin might be a good drug to prevent breast cancer. And so we had um, we, we just this um, last year had the results of a long awaited study which assessed the efficacy of metformin in reducing recurrence risk. And so the study, which was a large randomized study, it took many, many years to report the results, took a group of women with ER positive high risk, as well as um, HER2 positive and triple negative breast cancer. So all subtypes of breast cancer who got their regular standard treatment and then were randomized to metformin for five years or to a placebo. And the results were disappointing. Um, the results showed that the use of metformin did not improve outcomes among women with early stage breast cancer. And a very important lesson for us to really um, wait for results of studies because um, we're, often, we're often surprised by results. Um, ah, there we go. And so um, let's move on to um, the advanced breast cancer setting. And there was lots of activity, particularly among HER2 positive breast cancer. And HER2 is a drug I spoke about at our last symposium. We were so excited because it had been granted accelerated approval for the treatment of advanced HER2 positive breast cancer. And the DESTINY study was recently reported um, that evaluated and HER2 used a second line therapy. So higher up in lines of therapy um, and like the first study which approved um, NHER2, the Destiny 3 really showed amazing results. And so NHER2 continues to be a drug which has really changed outcomes for this subtype of breast cancer. Other good news is to catnib, which was a drug also um, that had just been granted accelerated approval when I spoke a year and a half, and a half ago at this um, symposium. We have now updated results to show um, that the benefit of to catnib um, among women with HER2 positive breast cancer, even women with brain metastases continues to be very effective even with long-term follow-up. And so that is very exciting um, news. Near and dear to my heart as those who know me is scalp cooling. And so scalp cooling is um, a device that can be used um, during chemotherapy to reduce the risk of the hair loss associated with chemotherapy. It doesn't always work. It doesn't work for every chemotherapy program, um, but it is an option to reduce um, to reduce um, hair loss associated with chemotherapy for some women undergoing um, chemotherapy. Um, in 2017, the FDA cleared scalp cooling um, to reduce the risk of chemotherapy induced hair loss. We were very excited about it. In 2021, I updated you that. Um, with patient advocates, um, we were working to get CPT codes, which starts the pathway to allow insurance to cover scalp cooling. And just at the end of last year, it was announced that Medicare is likely to approve coverage um, of scalp cooling for women undergoing chemotherapy this year. So we're very excited about this. Um, so I hope I've, all, I've left you all um, with the notion that the future is bright um, for women diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, and I will pass the baton on to our next speaker. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. My name is, my name is uh, Guy Maytel. As Dr. Sigler mentioned, I'm a psychiatrist here at Weill Cornell, and uh, I take care of people who are dealing with cancer. I, you know, I'm really glad to talk with you for a few moments, and let me pull up my slide, slides. Can you see my slides? Tessa, can you just nod yes? Yes. No? Great, thank you. Awesome. All right, well, uh, here we go. So I'll be concise and uh, took on a topic uh, 
as broad as this one, cancer, stress, and resilience, what I want to do is touch on a couple of things. And I come at this conversation with all of you with, I think, a healthy dose of humility and curiosity, being the only uh, man on this panel talking to a group of women who have dealt with and are dealing with breast cancer. Um, but I do spend most of my time listening to people and engaging and coaching people who are dealing with cancer. Um, so I want to talk about stress. And when, when you hear stress, uh, mostly people think of this, stress is a bad thing, how can I get less of it in my life? And uh, no stress is a good thing. How can I have more of this no stress thing? So the real, uh, the real is it good, is it bad? The answer is it kind of depends. As this one person is telling her friend, honey, stress is not simply par for the course, it is the course. And the notion of stress <clears throat> is a lot broader than we normally think of. And, I'll, and I want, hopefully today we'll talk a little bit about the bigger and bigger picture of stress and how you can shift things a little bit or more than a little bit so that you've got more of the good stress and less of the bad stress. S stress itself is a scientific term. It was coined about 100 years ago, a little bit less. It really talks about the bo body's automatic response to demands, to challenges, and to change. And stress, in the way we're talking about it, is anything in the environment that require behavioral adjustment. That could be everything from getting a cancer diagnosis to having a new partner in your life to getting a new job, things of that sort. But there are really two subcomponents. There's the one that we're more familiar with called distress. That's where the term actually comes from. Uh, it's there where there is a negative response on the part of us to whatever is coming at us. There's also something called eustress or good response that leaves you with a sense of joy, fulfillment, achievement. So at some point, you know, there is this distress level, but at some point having some stress is actually really helpful in terms of what it is you want to accomplish in life. Too little and you don't get off the sofa. Too much and you don't get off the sofa for different reasons. So how do you find kind of that right balance between eustress and distress is really the question. It's not about how do I get rid of stress. That's not a useful because it's always there. And then, of course, there is the stress of cancer in early adulthood, which is like such an enormous topic. So I apologize for reducing it to like a couple of slides, because it's not just a disease. It is so much bigger than an illness. Cancer has so many layers of meaning, impact so many different aspects of life. So and the, first, the biggest one is I say cancer, the first word that comes to mind is death or at least mortality, or at least a profound uncertainty, the, some version of my life wasn't supposed to go this way. And it opens up all sorts of uncertainties in terms of prognosis, treatment side effects. Can I work? Will I have children? I'm single, I don't wanna be, I'm married. How does it impact? I'm partnered, how does it impact it? Uh, the ability to maintain social roles as a parent, as a caregiver to elders, financial uncertainty, all of that in that one little word. And it causes, it impacts a lot of different areas of life. I'm not going to go through all of these, and you're all familiar with most of them. But no matter what, even if it's not about death per se, anything unexpected can lead to feelings of apprehension and anxiety. You know, these pilots thought they were in the middle of the sky, uh, but then one of them says to the other, say, what's a mountain goat doing way up here in a cloud bank? So you, you think life is on a particular trajectory and then all of a sudden there's a mountain goat in front of you. And here's the challenge for us in dealing with stress in the modern day. Uh, the way our bodies are designed is to design active and imminent threats to our existence, like a lion or a bear coming at us or somebody with a spear being thro thrown at us. That's the physiology of it. Um, we almost never experience that. Even when you get a diagnosis of cancer, the truth is or the moment before and the moment after you're actual reality is on change. There's some new information that you have to contend with. Um, but it's rare that it's you're going to die now, but the body reacts as if you are. 
that's the real challenge. And if that stress is, is chronic over a long time, such as dealing with a major medical illness, the body doesn't know what to do with it. You know, the fight or flight response dies down pretty quickly. Often we enter in the freeze, see that fl fight or flight list is short by one. It's fight, flight, or freeze, which is mostly where we live under prolonged stress. It's kind of this deer in the headlights. Let me just hunker down and get through it. So as I said, a stressor is anything that throws your body out of balance. And the body responds the way it does, changing hormones, nervous system changes, other physiologic changes, and medical illness is a, also a psychological stressor. Everything from all of the emotions, thoughts, worries that it throws at you to even the notion of being a patient. Like that is a new job you get when you get a cancer diagnosis, especially at a young age when you may not have had any medical issues before. It's like learning a new job that you're not paid to do and didn't interview for. Now, that having been said, there is this gradient of, of threat, right? On the one hand, Cancer could lead some people to experience real worries about where is my next meal coming from? How am I going to afford bills? It also leads to shame when that shows up and people may miss appointments because they have too much anxiety, worry, stress, or simply don't know how to deal with life and now being a patient. And it can force people into significant financial distress. There's a term called financial toxicity, which I think is a terrible term because there's nothing inevitable about the cost of cancer. We created a system, but it does have a phenomenal impact on people's lives when all of a sudden you have to deal with the costs of having cancer that may be covered by your insurance, but maybe you're undercovered or all the other ancillary costs take, a, take their toll. And here's the thing, all of that is the, all the negative side of stress. And yet to quote Taylor Swift, Stress is the critical ingredient to any success. So how do you, what does that mean? There is this positive stress. There is this use stress. It, it like motivates us. It has us uh, be more focused. It's short term, but it's whatever the challenge in front of us is, we see it as within our abilities to manage. It feels like even exciting and this kind of stress improves our performance. You know, this is, a, uh, Elizabeth Harrington, she's a free climber. This is El Capitan, that is not Photoshop. This is about 2000 feet above sea level. She climbed this whole thing without any ropes. This is good stress for her. For me, I can barely look at this picture without getting a little lightheaded. But she does this and this is fine. She's challenged, but not so much that she is frozen. This young woman competing in the final round of the scripts spelling bee competition similarly. This is the kind of stress that has us step up, expand, feel accomplished, and is actually very helpful. Whereas this stress, it causes anxiety, it can be short or long-term, and it looks like it's outside of our coping abilities. And it can lead to all sorts of problems. I use the words look like or perceived because that's the key. The key is, is, is whether it's you stress or is this thing distress, the context is decisive. This is gonna sound, might sound a little strange, even radical, but like your response is, our responses are actually filtered through our interpretation of events. Is what's in front of us a challenge or a threat? Is it something that will allow us to get closer to people, grow, or is it going to be something that will have me hunker down and isolate? Is it a shouldn't be, or is it the way it is? And figuring out how to balance between those two makes all the difference between feeling like this is something I can take on and do, because it's what I have to deal with in front of me, or I can't. Again, the issue is not the amount of stress you have, but how you how well you can cope with it. In other words, that's what resilience is. Resilience speaks to the ability to recover quickly from illness, from change, or misfortune. Another way to say it is buoyancy. Easier said than done, 
and useful to know. So what can you do? Well, reduce distress, enhance resilience. What does that look like? Here are a couple of simple things to start to look from. These are not the answers. There's nothing here you have to do. These are suggestions, places to look from, places, things to consider. First is simply taking care of yourself, including learning re stress reduction techniques, connecting with people, setting appropriate boundaries and limits, telling your story, and even practicing hope. I'll go through a couple of these because like I said, we only have a short time, but taking care of yourself is so important and it's gotta go to the top of your priority list, even and especially if other people are counting on you. You know, human beings need regular sleep, need regular meals, need some sort of physical movement, whatever your body can tolerate, need some sunlight, need some water. Human beings need to do what they enjoy and if you can't do what you enjoy, be kind to yourself. And human beings get sad and excited, angry and happy, tired. Being taking care of yourself means all of it's okay, giving you space for all of it's fine. And we're social creatures to whatever degree that's your thing to connect with other people, which includes taking care of others as well as allowing others to take care of you. And there are many stress reduction techniques. Some of you, I'm, sh I'm sure you're familiar with some of them, if not all of them. They all induce this particular eustress response that allows folks to climb cliffs and participate in spelling bees. It's not simply about kind of zoning out, although that's useful at times. It's about reducing the distress enough so that you can function well. So some of these include exercise, lots of different meditation types. There's the silent focused meditation types that you can, when you think of meditation, you often think of people sitting still, but that also includes prayer for those for whom religion and prayer is a part of their lives. It also includes active things like yoga. There's even something called laughing meditation where people get together and laugh. And you kind of start like a forced laugh, but eventually when you start laughing, it kind of gets contagious, even something as hypnosis. And connecting with people is so important. Groups like this, one of the things I often uh, share with patients is everyone in your life speaks your language. In this case, it's English, but not everybody. In fact, mostly people don't speak cancer. It's so important to have a place where you can talk in a way and be listened to in a way that you feel heard. And you can share everything when, when appropriate, your joy, your sadness, your fear, Support groups help, psychotherapy helps. Like I said, I'm giving you kind of a scattering the seeds of what could help. So that's where I'm gonna stop because I'm right on, out of time. But the thing to walk away with is maybe, just maybe you have a say as to whether what's in front of you is in this category of good stress or bad stress. And the more you the more you actually consider that you have a say, you can start to take an action to right the balance so that you can function more effectively in all that you need to do and handle. So I'm going to stop right here. I think I'm out of time. I'm going to turn it over to the next speaker. Hello, everyone. I am just pulling up my slides for a second. Bear with me. Okay. Oh. Hold on. All right, can everyone see me and the slides? Okay. Yes. All right, thank you. My name is Emily. I am the dietitian at the Weill Cornell Breast Center, and I'm so excited to be here today. Today is also actually a national um, RD day, so it seems fitting to be talking about nutrition at an event like that to celebrate 
RD Day, and it's also National Nutrition Month. So what I'm going to talk about today is just a few different facts um, and myths related to breast cancer and nutrition. I get asked about these at least once a day, um, so I just wanted to kind of help everyone understand a little bit more on what you can eat, what you shouldn't eat, and hopefully you learn something new today. So this talk will review the relationship between sugar and cancer. It will debunk myths related to soy and breast cancer, and it will help you better understand the risks and benefits of supplements. So the first myth that I wanted to address is does sugar feed cancer? So what we know about sugar and cancer is that carbohydrates in our, are in our foods and they are made up of sugar and starches. Your body breaks down carbohydrates into glucose. Glucose goes into your bloodstream then travels to our cells for energy. Glucose is essential to fuel our cells and provide energy to our body. Glucose is actually the first source of energy we use. Um, so it's critical that we consume it on a day-to-day -day basis. The unfortunate thing is both normal cells and cancer cells use glucose for energy. So does eating sugar cause cancer? The short and simple answer is no, it does not. However, not all carbohydrates or sugars are created equal. So certain foods rich in sugar in, or in glucose, shall we say, provide essential nutrients such as fiber, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, things that we need on a day-to-day -day basis. Healthy sugars include foods such as unprocessed whole foods. So those can be found in things like whole grains. So that would be foods like oats and wheat bread and brown rice and quinoa and farro. That would include starchy vegetables. So things like potatoes, peas, and corn. It would include fruits and that is all fruits. And it would even include dried fruits. Added sugars are the things that we want to try to minimize. So those are found in things like concentrated sweets and refined grains. So those would be more of the category of things like desserts and cookies and pastries and bagels and pasta and all of those foods. Those have no fiber. They typically provide no nutritional value. And a lot of them provide a lot of saturated fat. And that's something that we don't want to have a lot of in our diet. Eating these high sugar foods and these unprocessed refined grains typically contribute to someone gaining weight. And what we know is being overweight or obese can significantly increase your risk of cancer. And it can also increase your risk of many other illnesses as well, such as high cholesterol, hypertension, diabetes, the list goes on and on. So how do you know if you are obese? Um, you know, and this can be a very sensitive topic for people, whether you are a patient at Weill Cornell, where I work, or any other healthcare facility, what BMI is, is it's your body mass index. So the way we figure it out is we just do an equation that kind of figures out your height and weight and brings you to this body mass index. Most patient medical records will have your BMI listed on there if you're not sure where to look or who to ask. The, for most patients, we want them to be in this green range. So the ideal range would be between 18.5 to about 25. I do have patients that I work with that their BMI is, you know, 25, 26. And that's not so worrisome either if you're eating a well-balanced diet and you're exercising regularly. Where we really want to be careful of is becoming 30 or above with the BMI. And if that's something that you are struggling with, you absolutely should see a dietitian, and they can help you individualize, you know, a meal plan that works for you to help get your weight down, make better eating habits, just to kind of get you in a better healthy weight range. With obesity, so right now we know that obesity can increase risk of at least 12 different types of cancers. I'm sure we will find out in the future that there will be more. Um, so it's really important that we eat a well-balanced diet and try to be the healthiest body weight that we're capable of being. So the 12 cancers are listed over here. It's esophageal cancer, liver cancer, kidney cancer, 
stomach cancer, colorectal cancer, prostate cancer, postmenopausal breast cancer, gallbladder cancer, pancreatic cancer, ovarian cancer, and endometrial cancer. So with sugar guidelines, the most important takeaway here is that quality and quantity of carbohydrates are really what matters. When, when you choose carbohydrates, we want you to choose plant-based unprocessed carbohydrates, things like fruits and vegetables, beans, lentils, dried fruits, all of these different fiber-rich foods. These provide much nutritional value. They are anti-inflammatory and they typically have no saturated fat or trans fats as well. When it comes to the refined grains, these are the things that we really want people to limit, which is those white flours and desserts and sweets. We're all human, including myself. When I say these things, it does not mean you can never have a bagel again or you can never have a cookie again, because what good would that do? Really what I mean by that is save your bagel for once a week or if you're cooking for your children and they really love regular pasta, have pasta with your meal twice a week, but add different veggies, you know, add a lean protein. And maybe the other days of the week, you'll, you know, you can have your children try a potato or brown rice or some other grain to just kind of balance out the meals throughout the week. You wanna to aim to consume less than 10% of your daily calories from added sugars. Avoid food and drinks with added sugars. Wheat and beverages like soda are the leading source of added sugar in the United States today. Desserts and sweet snacks are close behind. The American Heart Association recommends women consume less than 25 grams of sugar per day, which is kind of a hard number to measure. So an easier way to do it is roughly about 100 calories of sugar per day or six teaspoons per day. You wanna to try to be under that on a day-to-day -day basis. In summary, with sugar and cancer, added sugar feeds inflammation and obesity, and we know that inflammation and obesity increase the risk of cancer. Excess added sugars are not healthy sources of carbohydrates or other nutrients we need to function. Healthy sugars, such as those unprocessed carbohydrates, are essential for energy and survival, and they are part of an anti-cancer diet. Myth number two, soy causes breast cancer. So what is soy? Soy is a protein naturally found in foods such as tofu, tempeh, soy milk, miso, and legumes such as soybeans and edamame. Soy contains estrogen-like chemicals called isoflavins. Isoflavins are called phytoestrogens because they come from plants. As humans, our bodies produce estrogen, and estrogen is a hormone that impacts several functions within the body. The similarity of phytoestrogen to estrogen is why people mistakenly think that eating soy is related to breast cancer risk. Hormone receptor breast cancer use human estrogen to grow and spread disease. Some worry that eating phytoestrogens in soy food can increase estrogen in their body and encourage breast cancer growth. However, no studies in humans have shown a link between eating soy and increasing your risk for breast cancer. There are also some studies to suggest that soy may actually help protect against breast cancer and other hormone sensitive cancers. So things like gynonc cancers and prostate cancer but more research is needed to be done. In summary, it is best to eat soy in moderation as part of a healthy diet that includes plenty of lean proteins, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and plant-based fats. So those would be things like avocado, olive oil, olives, walnuts, almonds, things like that. Choose natural soy-based foods like the ones that I mentioned before. So things like tofu, tempeh, soy milk, edamame, and avoid processed soy food. So that would be things like protein bars. A lot of them have processed soy protein in there or protein shakes. If you are gonna have a protein shake, try to avoid one with soy protein powder. Instead, either pick a whey or pea-based protein powder or something natural like a nut butter or yogurt or silken tofu or something like that. 
natural soy based foods are safe to include on a day to day basis. The US Food and Drug Administration says that eating 25 grams of soy per day offers health benefits such as reducing the risk of heart disease. And it is also part of this anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer type of diet. However, be wary of isoflavin supplements. They are processed and generally higher in soy than a standard diet. So with this, real soy is the key, soy supplements, soy products, you want to try to stay away from. And lastly, we'll, I'll do a little quick overview on just some different supplements. I didn't get to put in everything that I would want to with these supplements, but I just wanted to give people a general overview on certain supplements that I get asked about on a regular day-to-day -day basis. So what are dietary supplements? Today's dietary supplements include vitamins, minerals, herbals, botanicals, amino acids, enzymes, and many other crazy products. Dietary supplements come in a variety of forms, traditional tablets and capsules. They're also now in powders and even sports drinks and energy bars. They're everywhere. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration does not determine whether supplements are effective before they are marketed. And they also do not regulate what is actually in the supplement. So here are some potential risks that I found interesting and wanted to note. This is a little bit of an outdated study from 2013, but exposure to supplements accounted for greater than 100,000 calls to the U.S. Poison Control Centers in 2013. Another few things to keep in mind, vitamin A, an antioxidant, which patients take a lot, may cause headache, liver damage, reduce bone strength and cause birth defects, which is important to know if women are still trying to conceive. Also some of the medications that you're put on as a breast cancer patient already reduce bone strength. So that's something important to take note of. Excess iron can cause nausea and vomiting. It can damage the liver and other organs. It also can cause hemochromatosis. So this is another thing where patients, when they're getting chemo, often want to take iron because they see their hemoglobin is dropping. And so again, you just want to be weary, speak with the dietitian, speak with your medical oncologist just before you start anything like that. Another supplement that everyone started taking a lot of in the pandemic was zinc. And zinc is another supplement that if you take it for an extended period of time, it actually can cause copper deficiency. And so copper deficiency can cause taste changes, it can cause fatigue, and it can be very dangerous actually. So you don't want to take zinc for longer than two weeks at a time when you are going to take it. Some drug interactions that are common. So vitamin K can reduce the effectiveness of blood thinners such as Coumadin. St. John's wort can speed breakdown of drugs and reduce the drug's effectiveness on medications such as antidepressants and birth control pills. Antioxidant supplements such as vitamins A, C, and E might reduce the effectiveness of some types of chemotherapy and radiation. And then we'll talk about some potential benefits. So a few benefits of some of the more common supplements I get asked about are calcium and vitamin D. They are important and they keep bones strong and they help reduce bone loss. Folic acid decreases the risk of certain birth defects. Omega-3 from fish oils may help some people with heart disease. Iron is appropriate with the right dose when someone does have iron deficiency anemia. And vitamin B12 is also appropriate at the right dose if someone has B12 deficiency. A few other little highlights, I tried to you know, expand on a few of the supplements that I get asked about a lot. So vitamin C, a lot of people take this in the winter to build immunity. So here's a breakdown of some important information about vitamin C related to cancer. So how it works, it's important for maintaining general health supplementation may not help lower the risk of cancer. So that's important to note. Side effects, if you take too much of it, can cause nausea, diarrhea, and stomach cramps. You should not be taking vitamin C 
supplements if you're undergoing chemotherapy or radiation because this may interfere with treatment and lessen the effect. Some studies suggest that vitamin C from foods can reduce risk of certain cancers. Most large trials did not find vitamin C supplements to prevent cancer. And then other clinical studies show that oral vitamin C is not effective, likely due to limited absorption. And high dose injectable vitamin C is still under investigation as a cancer treatment. So in summary with this, really what it's saying is that food first, supplement second, is that sometimes these supplements do more harm than good. And the big picture here is really to just have a diet rich in all of these vitamins and minerals. Another supplement I get asked about all the time is turmeric. It is an anti-inflammatory spice, but you can get the same effect from cooking with it. And there's also a lot of other anti-inflammatory spices people can cook with as well. It includes things like cinnamon, garlic, rosemary, thyme, ginger, so these are all probably things people are using, whether it's in tea or cereals or other dishes that they're making. So again, you probably don't need it in a mega dose pill form, but here are some overview. So lab experiments show that curcuminoids in turmeric prevent inflammation by inhibiting the molecules that cause it. Uh, stimulants flow of bile in the GI tract neutralizes molecules that cause DNA damage, such as free radicals. Some possible GI tracts are pretty mild here. It, you can get GI discomfort if you have too large of a dose, and you may have a possible allergic reaction, which you would know you might have some itching, hives, things like that. Nothing major. You should not take in pill form, megadose pill form, if you are taking tamoxifen, if you are on chemotherapy drugs, such as doxorubicin or cyclophosphamide, if you are taking any immunosuppressants or on warfarin or any other blood thinners. Cancer prevention. So several animal studies suggest that turmeric prevents colon, stomach, and skin cancers in rats. More, more studies need to be done for people. And there is a trial underway to evaluate safety and efficacy of turmeric in patients with metastatic disease of patients undergoing chemotherapy. In summary with supplements, there is no evidence available that dietary supplements can prevent, treat, or cure cancer. Specific nutrients may interfere with chemotherapy medications and radiation therapy. Some of those are vitamin A, C, and E. Dietary supplements marketed to prevent, treat, or cure cancer may be scam and potentially dangerous or life-threatening. If in doubt, oncology registered dietitians slash nutritionists, CSO, are the experts in food and nutrition who motivate, counsel, and advise patients on what, when, and how much to eat and drink to achieve specific health-related goals based on individual needs, medical histories, and preferences. So if any of you do have specific nutrition questions, if you are treated at Cornell, um, I can absolutely see you. If you are treated at another healthcare organization, they should have CSO oncology certified dietitians at your cancer centers as well. So feel free to reach out to them, ask the doctor to put in a referral if you have more questions or want individual counseling. That's it. Thank you, everyone. Let's try this. Can hear you, now. you can hear me now? Yes. We can hear you, but we were seeing you, but we can't. Oh, and now, now we can see and hear you. Okay, you can see and hear me. Yeah. You can see and hear me. Okay, hi guys. Sorry you missed my spiel. I am Sarah of Damn Good Yoga. Um, welcome. Um, I was saying that I am a fellow survivor sister. I finished treatment almost a year ago. And so I'm with you guys. 
Uh, and today's flow is going to be a short, sweet little opening. We open up our chests, open up our hearts, and no matter if you are mid treatment, if you are way past your treatment, Starting. Um, I want this to feel like a celebration of your body. All right, and I'm being told to turn off the background music, which I'm going to do. Do you guys love technology? Hi, all right, let's do this. No more music, just me. All right, meet me on the floor. You don't need a mat. You can have a towel or whatever you have around. And you're going to meet me into a child's pose, yeah? So you're going to take your toes together, let your knees go nice and wide. Yeah, and then you're going to go ahead and reach both of your arms forward and let your head go down to the ground. And as you stay into this child's pose, I want you to deepen your breath. You'll go in through your nose and out through your mouth. And allow yourself to breathe a little better, a little more deeply. Let some sighs go. Let go of anything you need to today. Just a few more breaths in through the nose and out through the mouth. Good. On your next breath in, come forward to a tabletop. So you'll stack your shoulders over your wrists, your hips over your knees. Now close your eyes and start to find cat cows. So you're going to arc your spine. Inhale, look up, open your throat. Exhale, tuck your chin round your spine cat. Good. Keep going like that. Inhale. You'll arc your spine. Look up, cow. Exhale. You'll round your spine, cow. And I want you to keep moving in your body, right, with your eyes closed. Use your breath, and you can turn this into some circles of the head, circles of the hips. And just notice where you're holding on to tension, right? Usually it's your shoulders. Usually it's your neck. Couple more rounds of breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. And the next time you finish your exhale, come to a neutral spine. You're going to meet me in a downward facing dog. Tuck all 10 toes under, lift your hips high, and form an upside down V. And I want you to land here. You can pedal out your legs a little bit, move around a little side to side. And stretch the back of the legs, bend the knees, stick the butt up and back. And now look forward and take tiny little baby steps all the way to your head. And as you let yourself hang over your legs, grab opposite elbows and just sway your body a little side to side, releasing the neck, the head, the jaw. Bend your knees a little to let your low back open up. Great, take a deep breath in and let your arms dangle on the breath out. You're going to slowly roll your body all the way up to stand. On the inhale, you'll lift your head up. You'll reach your arms up high, look up. And on the exhale, I want you to open your arms wide like you're uh, in the movie Titanic, right? Like you're Rose standing on the front of the ship and you're just opening up your arms, open your chest, look up. And have a little moment, like, holy moly, I'm here. Flip your palms, reach behind you, interlace your fingers. Pull your fist back, lift your heart up, take a big breath in. And then just find this little back bend on the breath out. Feel your shoulder blades moving together a little more. Good, take a big breath in. Three times, I want you to bend your knees. You're going to fold your body forward over your legs on the breath out. Again, tuck your chin. Roll your body up. Inhale, lift up, look up. Exhale, arc your spine down. Good. Do that one more time. Inhale, roll yourself up, look up. Exhale, arc your spine down and just stay there. Let your fists move over your head a little bit and let that neck hang heavy. So then take one more breath in. Let your hands come down to the ground on the breath out. Good. Take a little half lift, lengthen your spine. You're going to plant your hands and slide your left foot as far back as you can. Drop your left knee and uncurl your toes. Then you're going to take your hands, interlace them on your right quad, and I want you to push forward with your hands and lift your chest up. 
Okay, just make sure you're breathing nice and deeply, stretching the front of that left thigh. All right, where you are in this body today, we celebrate, we breathe, we move. Look up, take an inhale, land your hands to the ground on the exhale. You're gonna reach your right arm up and find a little twist. Open up and back bend. Yeah, and you might even look up at that right thumb if it feels okay on the back. But one more breath in, land your right hand to the ground, tuck your left toes, lift your left knee, downward facing dog, step your feet back. On the inhale, you're just gonna roll your body forward, high plank. On the exhale, child's pose, sit on your heels. Inhale, tabletop, come forward. Exhale, downward facing dog, lift your hips up and back. Good, and then look forward towards the top of the mat and take tiny little steps all the way back to your hips. Good, soften your knees, roll your body all the way up to stand. Let's move all that with breath. Reach your arms up, inhale. Open up your arms, exhale, have your Titanic moment. I'm alive. Ah. Reach behind you, interlace your fingers. Inhale, lift your heart up, look up, breathe in. One time, exhale, fold forward, breathe. Take a little half lift, lengthen your spine. Other leg, right leg goes back as far as it can. Drop your knees and uncurl your toes. Now rise right up onto that right knee. Interlace your hands on your left thigh again. And think, push the hands down and forward as you lift the chest up. And just breathe here. I love what Dr. Mytal said about resiliency, right? Like being resilient is being able to wake up to a new body every day. And we know as cancer patients, you never know what you're gonna wake up to. You don't know how you're gonna feel. But being able to move in celebration, even on the days we wake up feeling horrible. One more breath in. Land your hands to the ground on the breath out. Inhale, reach your left arm up and twist. Yeah, and then keep expanding your body. Keep wrapping the left shoulder open. Like celebrating each day the small things that we can. The fact that we can do a child's pose. We can do a twist. Tuck your right toes, lift your right knee. Huge inhale. Swim your left arm over your ear. It's downward facing dog on the exhale. Inhale, come forward to a high plank. Exhale, child's pose, sit on your heels. Inhale, come forward to a tabletop. Good, this time you're gonna rise all the way up onto your shins. Knees are about hip width apart. But let's take that same vocabulary we learned. Inhale, reach your arms up high, look up. Exhale, open your arms wide, right? This is that moment, this is that opening. Like I am receptive, I am here. And then take your hands to your low back. Press them down, fingertips facing down, elbows wrap in for a little camel pose. And I want you to think, lift your heart up and then come up and back and just breathe right here. Right, the moment you wanna close physically, emotionally, we keep opening, we keep staying open to where we are in this moment. One more breath in. Breath out. On the inhale, lift your arms all the way up. Exhale, sit on your heels. Take your palms face down on your thighs. Close your eyes for a moment. And just notice how you feel. Notice your heart beating in your chest. Take some deep breaths in. And full breaths out. Like in the depth of my chemo and the depths of my treatment, I used to do yoga. Take a few more inhales and exhales. I used to do yoga in my underwear, right? So, so I could bring myself closer to myself even on the days where I hated myself. Like that's this practice. One more breath in, breath out. Float your eyes open, swing your legs around, and then we're gonna keep the feet hip width apart, bend your knees, grab the back of your hamstrings. On the inhale, I want you to lift up, arch your spine, look up, breathe in. 
exhale, tuck your chin around, go down halfway on the breath out. We're going to do that two more times. Inhale, arc, lift, look up. Exhale, you'll tuck and you'll round. One more. Inhale, arc, look up. You're going to go all the way onto your back. Exhale. Open up your arms. Take your feet right under your hips. Scoot your hips to the right. Let your knees twist over to the left. Now you can take the left hand on the right thigh. You can look over the right shoulder. But I want you to really reach that right arm over to the right, right? This is such a good shape and stretch for any of my ladies that have had either breast surgery, mastectomy, lumpectomy, you name it. It stretches all the fascia across your chest. One more big breath in. Breath out. Bring your knees back to center. And then scoot your hips over towards the left. Let your knees go over towards the right. You can always take your right hand to your left thigh. Look over that left shoulder and breathe. Three more rounds of breath. Every time you exhale, release that left shoulder a little more. One more breath in. Breath out. Swim your left arm across your body. Lift yourself all the way up to a nice, easy seat. Cross-legged, you can sit on your heels, you can sit up onto a block. But all I want you to do on your inhale is reach your arms all the way up, lift up. Open up your arms wide, open your chest. Just one last time, look up. The shape physically helps us to conquer fear. It helps us to really just open and trust. It's vulnerable. Good, take one more breath in. Exhale, take your left hand to your heart, stack your right hand on top of it and bow your chin. Feel the beat of your heart under your hands. And remember, this practice of yoga, this practice of movement isn't about a performative shape, isn't about beating yourself up for your body not being where it used to be, it shouldn't be where it used to be. Practice of yoga is showing up and moving in the body you're in right now. Whether or not you have enough energy just to simply sit up straight and breathe, or you have enough energy to do a full practice, it's that showing up and meeting yourself where you are day after day, week after week, and bringing your mind, your body, and your heart together again. That union, that is the yoga. Take your hands between your eyebrows. Go ahead and bow forward and we say namaste to all of you brave, beautiful baddies out there. Thank you guys. Thank you so much for joining me. I will pass the torch over to my beautiful, beautiful friend, Sammy. Hi, girl. Hi, Sarah. Uh, <laughs> thank you for bearing with my technological drama, y'all. But um, take it away, Miss Friggs. <laughs> thank you so much, Sarah. Um, and hi, everyone. My name is Samantha Fergenti. Thank you to the team at Wild Cornell and Five Under 40 for inviting me to share my story. I'm so honored to be a part of this incredible panel. So I'll start with a sentiment that I'm sure resonates with everyone who's listening tonight. Uh, 2020 sucked. <laughs> All things considered, I was fortunate to have an okay start to the year. I began a dream job at the New York City Health Department doing critical and purposeful work on the COVID-19 response. I was privileged that none of my family and friends were seriously harmed by the virus. And by August, things were even starting to open up again. When SoulCycle started to offer outdoor classes, I could not wait to get back on a bike. In the shower after this first class back, I was reflecting on how rejuvenating it felt to finally do something normal again, when I felt a lump about the size of a ping pong ball at the top of my right breast. 
While my mom and I agreed it was probably nothing, we had a nagging feeling to get it checked out. For me, this feeling was a result of my job. At, at the time, COVID cases were down and the health department was urging people to seek the medical help they had been putting off. So with that in mind, I messaged my Wall Cornell gynecologist and found myself lying down on an ultrasound table two days later. I knew something was wrong when I was asked to stay for a mammogram. I remember sitting in the waiting room, decades younger than all of the other women around me, thinking to myself, what am I doing here? Three biopsies and two days later, two weeks after my 29th birthday, I received the call from my radiologist letting me know that I had stage two invasive ductal carcinoma. I went into a conference room at my office and called my boyfriend, Toma, who had been back home in Paris to see his parents for the first time in close to a year. I instantly broke down as I uttered the words, I have cancer. I heard him trying so hard to sound strong on the other end of the line, talking about getting on the next flight back to New York. While in the background, I hear his dad saying, putain merde. Um, and sorry for those of you who don't know what that means, but I don't think it's appropriate for me to translate it into English here. <laughs> Next, I made a dreaded call to my parents to let them know of my results. I felt heartbroken to tell them that their daughter was diagnosed with breast cancer. I tried to convey all the positive messages that my radiologist shared, that it's different than when grandma had it, that I already had an appointment scheduled with the top surgeon at Wild Cornell, and that this will just be a blip in my life. The next few weeks went by in a whirlwind of doctor's appointments, insurance calls, second opinions from doctors, unsolicited medical opinions from others, and an outpouring of love from friends and family. It was tough to reconcile having cancer at my age. Just like the day I got my mammogram, I was usually the youngest person in the doctor's offices, sometimes even mistaken for a guest or a visitor, and I found that most information online targeted older women. From diagnosis and throughout my treatment, my incredible all-woman medical team at Wall Cornell, including Dr. Siegler and Emily, who are on here tonight, uh, treated me not as a young cancer patient, but instead a young woman with cancer, a critical distinction that speaks to the holistic care they provide. I didn't feel like I was given a cookie cutter treatment plan, but a plan that factored in where I am in my life at this moment, and most importantly, the future I would like to have. This included speaking about freezing my eggs at my first appointment, introducing me to 540, and deciding on a single, not double, mastectomy. The time leading up to my mastectomy was filled with a range of emotions. Anticipation to get the cancer out, especially when I would feel the tumor, anxiety over undergoing major surgery, and unexpectedly, sadness. I had learned from other women about the fun ways that they got through the time leading up to their own mastectomies. However, COVID took away any chance of me having my own ta-ta to the ta-ta's party. Sensing my sadness, Tama decided to create our own COVID safe celebration. After searching every party store and sex shop near our apartment to no avail, Tama and I created our own giant boob balloon. We paraded it down Sixth Avenue back to our apartment and I soaked in all the laughs, funny comments and cheers from New Yorkers. It was the perfect send off heading into my mastectomy. I learned soon after my mastectomy that I would also need to undergo 16 rounds of chemotherapy. I read every blog and spoke to as many women as I could to try and prepare for the most daunting challenge of my life. I bought the tastiest ginger candies to cope with nausea, ordered a gallon size water bottle to stay hydrated each day, and even got my eyebrows microbladed so my face wouldn't look so bare when I eventually lost all my hair. I remember going to a wig store with Toma and my best friend on October 30th, forgetting it was the night before Halloween because I was too concentrated on starting chemo. While everyone around me was buying green or pink wigs, we tried to find the brown tone closest to my own hair, assembling my own costume of sorts of myself without cancer. I was determined to keep my life moving forward where I could, which meant I would continue to work 
and begin my part-time health doctorate program as planned. Chemo did not make this easy. And I remember I reached a breaking point one evening, evening when I was listening in on a lecture while multitasking on a work project and fielding back-to-back -back calls from nurses. However, I now realize work in school was exactly what I needed at that time. This focus on public health allowed me to approach my illness through an academic macro level lens to delve into research on screening procedures for women under 40 and assess questions about disparities in diagnosis and treatment for women across the US and the world. It helped me, put, it helped me to put my experience in a greater context and provided a meaningful distraction at the infusion center whenever I wasn't watching Bravo. <laughs> but the distraction of my work wasn't enough to shield me from the physical and mental side effects from chemo. Days dragged on feeling unsettled in my own skin and exhausted by the exertion it took to combat brain fog. Tama and I moved in with my parents on Long Island. And while this was definitely the best decision, I felt further removed from my former precancer self. My treatment left my immune system vulnerable, which during a pandemic meant I had to be extra cautious. Despite many socially distanced winter beach walks with my family and Toma and a constant stream of support from friends, I felt isolated. This was further compounded as I watched friends on social media begin to resume their lives again. I felt like Rapunzel stuck in her tower, except I quite literally had no hair to help me escape. During this time, I found myself in this strange dichotomy regarding my identity as a cancer patient. When I was speaking with people who knew of my diagnosis, I harbored such intense feelings of isolation, anger, and wanting nothing more than to not feel different. But when being near people who did not know, I felt this internal tug to shout at the top of my lungs, I'm a cancer patient, to explain why I look the way that I do, why I'm forgetting the word I was about to say mid-sentence because chemo has fried my brain, or why I wish you would just wear a damn mask around me. Another powerful tension I struggled with was the pull between gratitude and guilt. Feeling grateful that my cancer was caught when it was, that it was treatable, but feeling guilty that I somehow caused this, guilty of burdening my parents and Tama, guilty of having access to the best doctors in the world while others don't, and guilty over the tens of thousands of women who die each year from breast cancer. A final duality I'll share that defined my treatment experience is the paradox that you have to get sicker to get better. At the 2020 540 Wild Cornell Symposium, which happened to occur days before I started chemo, the survivor patient speaker, Ariel, shared the phrase, you have to get sicker to get better. This was something I repeated to myself throughout the months I underwent chemo. It brought me comfort when I caught a glimpse of myself in the mirror without hair, when I rushed into the tub to combat a sudden attack of neuropathy, and when I had to go to bed at 7 p.m. because I could not stay awake. You have to get sicker to get better. And I'm lucky that I did get better. The spring brought so, brought so much hope in the form of a COVID vaccine and an end in sight to chemo. Instead of feeling alone, I was filled with joy and gratitude. For Tuma, who uprooted his life to live with me and my parents and was by my side every step of the way. For my mom, who among all the ways she took care of me would grocery shop at 5 a.m. to minimize COVID exposures for our family. And for my dad, who drove me back and forth to the city for treatments, sometimes multiple times in one week, and would wait in the lobby for hours because COVID restrictions prohibited guests on the floor. Together, we counted down the completion of each treatment until finally, after about nine months since I was diagnosed, I was done. Excuse me. <laughs> While active treatment has ended, I'm finding the effects of cancer are still far reaching. I am on hormone therapy for the next 10 or so years, and I'm learning to navigate a changed body, mental health effects, and a life post-cancer. All of this is made easier with the community around me. 
In her memoir, Between Two Kingdoms, Suleika Jawad wrote that trauma has a way of dividing your view of the world into two camps, those that get it and those that don't. Jen and everyone at 540, thank you for curating a community of those that get it. I am so grateful for everything you have provided me and our community. I wish I could say I've had some profound life-changing revelation from this experience. I wish I actually would not get stressed out over little things. I still very much stress out over little things. <laughs> But instead of some grandiose change, I find myself savoring little moments that I don't think I would have noticed or fully appreciated if it were not for cancer. The glow of the Empire State Building as the sun is setting, random acts of kindness on the streets of New York. Yes, they do happen, I swear, if you're just paying attention. <laughs> A laughter shared with my parents and dancing with Toma in the kitchen. As I lift my head up after being so focused on cancer and work these past few two years, I look forward to making up for lost time with friends and family, for living life with more intention and savoring many, many more moments ahead. Thank you.